Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. This is the first show of 2022. I'm glad to have you with me. I'm Juliana Forlano. This is Act Now. Today on the show, the top lies of the capitalist order with Professor Richard Wolf. Who better to start off our year with than Professor Richard Wolf? We're also going to be talking about how Matt Damon is pushing crypto and lies. And uh, we're going to be covering the dead people. There's a lot of dead people people we love, people we cared about. We'll cover it. Also, kick-ass progressives are coming up the slate this year. Marion Williamson has an endorsee summit coming up, and one of her candidates that she has endorsed, Sheila Shurfless McCormick, is actually having her election on January 11th. I want to introduce you to her if you don't know her already. All that, and I got a little cat video for you of my brand new kitten, coming up at the end of the show. So stay tuned. Stay where you are. Hi, everybody. Well, uh, a bunch of people died since we last did a headlines portion. Harry Reid, Desmond Tutu, John Madden, Joan Didion. Unfortunately, it was no one that anyone might want to see go, except for maybe this one exception. Marjorie Taylor Greene's personal Twitter account. It is dead. That's right. Her personal Twitter account was suspended indefinitely for spreading lies about COVID. She'll now have to use you know, her professional account to spread her bullshit. <laughs> that one's still up. Also, Marjorie Taylor Greene's Facebook account was dead for 24 hours. But unfortunately, Lee, it's going to rise from the dead like Lazarus or that other guy that the right wingers claim to follow until his teachings conflict with their addiction to hate. Yeah, that guy. Harry Reid also passed away. He's going to be lying in state on January 11th. The former Senate Majority Leader was elected to the Senate as a conservative Democrat and over time became more and more progressive. Some of our most progressive politicians actually owe their careers to Reid, who apparently encouraged Elizabeth Warren to run for president, called AOC during difficult moments for her to encourage her, uh, and was partially responsible for Bernie Sanders' rise to the Senate. According to the Washington Post, Reid went from being a pro-gun, anti-abortion, and an initial supporter of Justice Clarence Thomas guy to a liberal icon who actually blew up the Senate's cherished filibuster rules to confirm more liberal federal judges for President Barack Obama. You see, we can blow up the filibuster if it's important, like reinstating some semblance of actual democracy. It's been done before, Chuck Schumer. You can do it. The Senate actually plans to vote on legislation to make changes to the filibuster uh, on January 17th. So we shall see. You know, the part of Harry Reid's career that I found fascinating was how he did what had to be done to help defeat Mitt Romney's presidential run in 2012. He used the bully pulpit on the Senate floor to say that Romney hadn't paid any of his taxes over the past decade. Everyone called Reid a big liar because Romney had actually paid some taxes in two of those 10 years, and then he refused to release information about the rest of those years. Reid made that blanket statement, and he kind of fudged the truth a little bit to make his point, which came across loud and clear and definitely helped take some points off of uh, Romney's support. And of course, this was back when being someone who takes advantage of people for profit and doesn't pay their taxes, you know, would not be considered a plus by the Republican electorate. Remember those days? And it was also back when Twitter uh, wouldn't run you out of town on a rail for not being a pristine adherent to some sort of unknowable Ten Commandments of pristine, liberal pristineness. Ugh, of course, moving on. Our beloved actress Betty White died at the age of 99. Clearly after People Magazine had already gone to print. I just saw this at the grocery store. Seriously, why is no one taking these off the shelves? It says like, hey, Betty White turns 100, but she's just... Oh, anyway, in addition to being a beloved actress, Betty was a lifelong activist for the humane treatment of animals. She supported foundations across the country and made other generous donations in the name of animal welfare. 
After Hurricane Katrina, she actually paid for the plane that relocated penguins and sea otters that were suffering in the destroyed zoo. She paid for the whole plane. It seems today that activists in general have forgotten about animal welfare. You don't hear that much about it anymore. Probably because all of all the crises in the sphere of human welfare. But the idea that some living things are okay to be subjugated and some aren't is unfortunately a problem that crosses the lines of genus and species. And if I might add, if we're, you know, subjugating animals is really and mistreating them is is <laughs> it's kind of at the base of a lot of other things, agricultural policy. A trade, uh, a whole bunch of other things are connected to this. So it's kind of interesting that that the the it, it gets like no media coverage. Uh, back to Betty White, though. For me, the Golden Girls were like family. I could very much relate to Sophia and Dorothy, and not so much Blanche, but you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> but Betty White played her character Rose Nyland perfectly. Here is a little bit of Betty White's work in that show as a tribute to her. Married. That's impossible, Clayton. Brothers can't marry sisters. <laughs> oh, that's right, you're from the South. This has to be the biggest disappointment of my life. Yes. Yeah, and I've known some real disappointment, too, believe me. Rose, you're not going to tell us that story about the exploding pig again, are you? <laughs> told you a story about an exploding pig, Dorothy. It was a peg-legged pig. <laughs> Our possum was the one that exploded. <laughs> I was just trying to be kind. Courteous, helpful. Well, duck it all. <laughs> I've had it up to here with your cheerful disposition. Oh, yeah. Do you think it's easy to be cheerful around you, too? You know how many of these stinking hot toddies I have to drink to keep out a happy face? <laughs> Let me tell you about a lesson that I learned when I was a little girl in St. Olaf. If you hold a bird gently, the bird will stay. But if you squeeze the bird, his eyes will bug out. <laughs> and Mr. Pet Shop owner gets very huffy and he won't let you touch the birds anymore. And the mice, he won't even let you in the room with the mice. What is eight times six? Okay, now that we have a few minutes. <laughs> Someone was actually able to deceive me once. Uh. Do tell, Rose. St. Olaf's most famous OBMAG. What's that? Obstetrician magician. <laughs> the amazing Shapiro. He delivered Bridget. But it was so confusing. It's a girl. Now it's a dove. Now it's a glass of milk. I don't know how he got her in that deck of cards. But there she was, right after the King of Hearts. Is this your baby? Ah, oh, thank you so much for playing that, for letting me play that. Hopefully, hopefully we don't get in trouble for that. R.I.P. Betty White. I'm Juliana Forlano. You're watching Act TV. Stay with us. Okay, Matt Damon did a new video for cryptocurrency. Have you seen it? It basically says if you don't buy some, you're a weak loser and a massive failure. And of course, it's all your fault. See if you can spot the total bastardization of the truth here. History is filled with almosts. With those who almost adventured, who almost achieved, but ultimately, for them it proved to be too much. Then there are others, the ones who embrace the moment and commit. And in these moments of truth, these men and women, these mere mortals, just like you and me, as they peer over the edge, they calm their minds and steal their nerves with four simple words that have been whispered by the intrepid since the time of the Romans. Fortune favors the brave. Okay, 
say, what the hell is that commercial even for? Until the very end, you don't even know. And did you catch it? Fortune favors the brave. It also, it also kills them in equal measure. I mean, did cowardice kill those first guys he showed? Or did running into a Category 4 storm in a sailboat? This is such a, like ego bullshit to believe that because you're at the financial top that you earned it. But Matt Damon says so, and you need to believe him because he's an actor, not an economist. The deceitful messaging that Damon's ad turns on is the central justification of the capitalist order, actually. It's the false notion that we live in a meritocracy where everyone can create and live their best life. And if you fail to do so, it's your own fault and you have only yourself to blame. Pay no attention to the capitalist behind the curtain. That capitalist needs you to fully internalize this message and then sit home in self-condemnation or maybe numb out an addiction or do anything to quash those painful feelings, you know, instead of getting into the street to protest the oppression. A study done at the Institute for Labor and Mental Health on the psychodynamics of work and family life showed that most middle-income people either carry consciously or unconsciously a painful self-blaming story about how they screwed up or failed in ways that have made them, you know, fail to achieve what they hope for in their lives. The meritocracy myth leaves out the roles of inherited wealth, limits on class mobility, unequal distribution of wealth. What else? Systematic dem uh, d discrimination? the resulting unequal access to education, health, longevity, all of it. And we are going to talk about the other illusions that prop up the capitalist order with my guest, Professor Richard Wolf, in our next segment. But insidious, the insidious results of the wound of this particular lie around meritocracy is that it makes people prey to right-wing propaganda, be it a news outlet or that other insidious tool of the state, their religions, that tell them that the source of their pain is the other of their society in the U.S., of course, that's been the African-American or the Native American or the homosexual or the immigrant or the Jew or the Muslim or LGBTQ, liberals, progressives, and the list just keeps going and going. And unfortunately, these folks believe it. And then they take action that actually allows the system to oppress them more deeply by voting for despots and attacking capitals. <laughs> What's the solution here? There are many. Speaking directly to that wound, naming it, claiming it, examining it for falsehood and discarding it as we're doing today might be one of them. Matt Damon making crypto commercials, ingraining the false narrative is not. I'm Juliana Forlano. You're watching ACT TV. Stay tuned. My interview with Professor Wolf is coming up in our new segment called Hello, Professor. Joining us today to talk about the top lies of the capitalist order is Professor Richard Wolf. He's the host of Economic Update. Professor Wolf, thank you for joining me on the program today. Thank you, Juliana, for such a dramatic opening. It's very sweet for you to prepare that. <laughs> I'm I'm glad that you liked it. I thought it was fitting. And um you know, I'm happy to be starting our year with you, 2020. I, I do thank you for all the other appearances that you've made. And and um, just talking with you is, is, I think, so important because you do that thing. You show people the lies in which they have been uh, just surrounded by the lies that prop up this order that then turns around and oppresses them. Um, we talked right before this about meritocracy. Did I miss anything in terms of what mer the idea of meritocracy does, uh, the falsehoods that lie in that idea, and um, how it props up capitalism? No, no. If anything, you were kind. You did not talk about some of the other ones. And I thought I'd just add one basic point. You know, you really can't have it both ways. If you want to believe that you live in a meritocracy where the people who rise up in a village, in a building, in an enterprise are those who've worked the hardest and have the greatest merit, then there has to be what people have always called a level playing field. 
you're going to reward. Everybody starts with the same, and you see how well each of us can do. But we don't have that, and we therefore can't claim a meritocracy. The children of Jeffrey Bezos or Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, they don't start on the same level playing field that anybody else does. I remember when I arrived at Harvard University, where I went to school, the child of immigrants who had no money at all, I very quickly learned that the bulk of my fellow students there came from very well-heeled backgrounds. They had all visited foreign countries. They had had tutors. They had been exposed to all manner of enrichment programs that my parents didn't even know about and couldn't have afforded anyway. Uh, there was no level playing field. Because I went well, to a public I, high school. They all went to Exeter and Andover, et cetera, et cetera. Did I mean, that I go into it forever? Yeah. But there's no level playing field. You can't claim that people got to where they got because of their merit. And by the way, we all knew that. It's yeah. not what you know, it's who you know. And all of us learned that. Professor Wolf, I had the exact same story. I'm the first generation child of uh, immigrant parents. And uh, I, you know, I wound up at a very good university. Um, immigrant parents often tend to rely on the education system to help their children move ahead. Do you think it had lasting effects on you to be one of the very few who understood what it was that people in the world, people, normal, non-well-heeled people were going through. I mean, what was the effect personally, if you don't mind my asking, on you being at these schools with these types of folks? Because I know it did have an effect on me. Yeah, it did have an effect on me. And I think the effect was complicated. I think, to be honest, that there were parts of me that became jealous. I mean, uh, I would occasionally visit their homes. And if I ever needed a refresher course on the difference between them and me, one minute in their apartment on the Upper East Side of New York or in their country house uh, up in Essex, Connecticut or something like that, and you saw real quickly what the difference uh, was. So there was an element of that. Then there was the fact that I got a lot of attention at those places because it became important for some of the folks there to make sure a person like me allowed into their hallowed halls uh, would come to celebrate and reinforce their sense that they belonged at the top of this pyramid. But it happened in my case, and that's a lot of my personal history, that all those efforts to persuade me, they didn't work. The, that's system, the system around me was so obviously unfair, so obviously cruel to those who didn't have the wealth and the opportunity that you would have had to been blind not to see it. Many of my fellow students saw it, but had a deep-seated sense that this is the way the world is, that there's nothing you can possibly do about it. So if you're- well, that's a nice to leave, justification to do nothing. Exactly. And yeah. so they went along and that's what they've been doing uh, much of the rest of their lives. I don't envy them for one minute. I'm very happy I spent my life as a critic of a system that needs criticism. And I'm glad I didn't spend my life moving money from one rich person to another by working as a stockbroker or an accountant or all the rest of those professions that my fellow students uh, went to. And, and so I, I was shaped in my way by these institutions, but not in the way they had hoped or intended. Fascinating. Thank you for sharing that personal story. I know we weren't we weren't intending on going personal, but I, I I'm very glad that you did. Um, so in addition to meritocracy and the lack of level playing field, what are the other top lies that people aren't really aware are lies that are propping up this oppressive system in which we live? Well, I thought I would pick a couple of them, uh, knowing that you were going to ask, and I want to pick one which is in the headlines all the time, so people will begin to understand it. And this has to do with COVID and what a society needs to do to cope with a virus like this. We've had them before in human history, in American history. We know exactly what kind of damage they can do. We know pretty well what you have to do to deal with them. This is not new. Nothing is new about COVID. So the only question is, was the society we live in, American capitalism, 
was it able to mobilize the private resources, the public resources to deal with this problem effectively? And the lie is the pretense that we did. We didn't. We are an immense, and I say this with no pleasure, we are an immense failure. Let me let me give you just two dimensions. And I'm I'm on purpose using the People's Republic of China as the other because it gets such a bad rap in this country. And it has its warts and its problems, just like every other society does. But on this question, there's no contest. As of today, the number of Americans, fellow citizens of you and me, Juliana, who have died from COVID is listed as 826,000 people. Mm -hmm. The People's Republic of China, where the virus began and where it has therefore been the longest, has a population four times larger than us, and they've not yet hit, get ready, 8,000 people. We have a hundred times more deaths from COVID than does a country four times larger than us. There is no excuse. Let me give you another statistic. New York City, as of today, yesterday in New York City, and I checked so I'd have it right, 86,000 people tested positive for COVID one day in one city. That's 10% of the town. Isn't that 10% of the whole city? Something I mean, like that. That's wow. right. something like that. Holy cow. Um, so it's a little small of it. In any case, Phil, there's close. a province that's getting a lot of attention these days in China. Xi'an, X-I apostrophe A-N is how it's spelled. That province in China has an intense lockdown uh, imposed by the Chinese government to control the COVID outbreak that happened there. That much our media tell us. What they don't tell us is how many cases of COVID they had yesterday in this province that they're shutting down. Get ready. 122 cases tested positive. 86,000 in New York, 122, and the population of that province in China is larger than the population of the city of New York. So these are failures. You can tell us how tough it is for the people in Xi'an province. The government is shutting everything down. That's what we hear. That's a lie. And it's a lie not because the specific things that are said are untrue. I wouldn't know how to evaluate that in any case. But let's assume they're true. The reality is, though, that they have contain this disease. They don't have millions of people sick, hundreds of thousands dead. That's the most important fact. And that's the one left out. That's a lie. That's huh? misteaching your own people. And it'll come back to haunt us that we have such crude propaganda instead of honest reporting. I'm actually finding it more difficult to be in a, a society where the disease is running rampant and we are not all in agreement or we're not all kind of locked down. Uh, for example, my ch I got an email. My, your child's doctor's office is closed because we don't have the staff to run the office. It's closed today. It might be closed tomorrow. Well, what do I do with my appointment? What do I do with what you know so that tosses all of that into when i go to the grocery store they're lacking in produce because they couldn't get it delivered because of a storm but also you know pe people calling out because of covid there are no rules in the store so when i'm shopping i have to go to the left of the one guy with the chin mask on you know there are all of these we're worried that you know certain school districts Certain schools in my child's district have closed down. Certain others are open. Well, I still have to go to work. Uh, you know, if she, it's it's crazy making and and it, and it makes you insane from one moment to the next. Um, it to me, it seems like these are real signs of a, a crumbling order in which we're living right now. I don't see how any other conclusion is possible. I mean, we are now entering the third year of this pandemic. It basically happened two years ago. So we're entering the third year. 
you would have thought even before it hit that we would have been smart enough to have backup. If you have a disease that affects a lot of people, if you have anything that could exhaust a lot of people, you have to have backup. For example, every aspect of our military understands that if social, if soldiers at the front get exhausted by what their situation is, you've got to have refreshments. You've got to have refreshing uh, groups of people who can stand in. Obviously, after two years, we know what can happen from COVID. It's just been a lesson to us. How is it possible that there's no backup? That when you call up, I went to my bank the other day across the street from where I live. There was a little hand set, uh, sign, and I don't mind mentioning TD Bank. It's a big one, at least in the Northeast here. TD Bank closed. Uh, I have my safe deposit box. If I had been scheduled to go on a trip and needed to get my passport, I wouldn't have been able to. I mean, right. This is not, and there's no explanation, yeah. no telephone to call. That's when you crazy. call the general number, you're told, we're very sorry, it may take a while to answer your phone because, because we're, we're short of staff. I mean, uh, whoa. Yeah. You know, th wow. This is the kind of thing which will eventually become humor in the United States because the if breakdown, you, you, you laugh <laughs> because the alternative is that you're going to cry. It is uh, a breakdown. Here's another one. Because Wait, I Professor wanna... Wolf, I just want to be clear on what is the lie under that's um, that you were talking about around the, the COVID lockdowns versus not lockdowns? I think the basic lie is this. You don't want to tell the people that in order to keep business going in America, to keep the profits flowing, employers, who are a very small number, need their workers to come to work. And so they want that large number to come. If they get sick, then they can stay home and you'll get others. But you don't want, you don't want your business interrupted. The Chinese, and by the way, the New Zealand is another example. They lock down and their records are, in, you know, I looked up New Zealand. You know how many deaths it's had from COVID since this pandemic began? 51. Oh, it's wow. a 51 I knew I should have moved there. It blows you. And this is not a, a, a socialist or communist country or anything like that. So I picked it just to make it clear. We're we're an outlier. We're the one of the worst performing countries on earth and it and really and we're the richest in many ways we have a well-developed medical system you can't blame the doctor you get, but the system as a whole is becoming dysfunctional becoming I mean, impossible for us to live with and lying to the people rather really, than saying hey here's what the truth would be and it, it's really because if the banks would just take a day off, like if all of the banks <laughs> would just close and stop pummeling people for their rent, pummeling people. for If we just took a pause, we would be able to have this kind of paused. I mean, the idea of a lockdown doesn't sit well with most Americans, just the term lockdown, but a, a pause, another pause. We may have had a pause before, but they certainly didn't pause you know, your bills from coming due, et cetera, if we just. But here's the irony, Juliana. We are in a lockdown. It's just a crazy, chaotic. I got locked down. I couldn't get into my bank. I, you got locked down because there were no vegetables in that part of the supermarket because they couldn't be. Pro we are having a, a succession mm -hmm. of mini lockdowns here, there, in the next place. But the difference is, there's no logic to them. They're not part of a program yeah. to defeat the disease. They are an accommodation to the disease so it can continue. We're not taking the steps, vaccination, masking, distancing, that could have been done. Look, here's another lie. You have to choose between having your kids in school, getting an education, or bending to the COVID. No, you don't. We could have bent to the COVID and reorganized our educational system. The minute the schools became unhealthy, all of the movie theaters in America became empty, using nothing. That's space. You could have a dozen classes distanced from one another in every movie house, in every concert hall, 
And I'm not even talking about the big stadiums, which have been empty all this time. Why wasn't there a program to continue education in safe ways that wouldn't cram all those kids in one school building, but open it all up? And you, a society that locked down and took care of these questions, which is what they've done in other countries, doesn't have our problems. We have now not locked down the first time the way other countries did, and now we're paying the price on the second and third go rounds. Mm -hmm. Lying always is more about the person who says the lie than about anyone else. <laughs> You're mostly lying to yourself when you lie to other people. Here's another one, though, that just as important. We are now seeing an inflation. I mean, the patience of the American people is unbelievable to me. We've just been ripped off during the greatest pandemic in a century. The rich have gotten much, much richer, as we all know. The rest of us are barely recovering from all of the psychological and family and income and job dislocations of two years. And what does this capitalist system hit us with? Uninflation. Let me be real clear. If your wages haven't gone up by at least 8%, January this year from January last year, if you haven't increased your income by 8%, you're falling behind. Mm -hmm. It means you can't afford with this year's income what you were able to afford a year ago. That's a horrible thing to do to people who have just gone through a major depression and the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And yet we permit it. And then we hear what are lies. Uh, the inflation is a mystery. Or the inflation comes because of supply chain disruptions, and they're a mystery. Uh, there's no mystery. I'm an economist. That's what I teach. A tiny number of people are responsible for prices in our society. We call them employers. They're the only ones who set prices. If you've ever been an employee, you might have noticed that your job description does not include setting the price of whatever <laughs> it is you help to produce. You know who sets the prices. They do, the employers. And you know what? They've raised them. That's what an inflation means. The employers have jacked up the prices. Mm. Now, why did they do it? I've got a real flash for you here. Why do employers do anything? They'll tell you, we're in business to make money. Profit is our bottom line. We learned how to run our business profitably when we got that MBA at the business school. That's why they're raising prices, because it makes them more profits. Mm -hmm. That's no secret. Mm -hmm. That's what's going on. The rest is their attempt to get away with doing something good for their profits that hurts the mass of people by finding somebody, anybody else, to blame. It's like Mr. Trump telling us that the problems of the American economy could be solved if we wouldn't let the desperately poor families from Central America come to the United States the way everybody else who's white came to the United States. I mean, it Unbelievable. You really have to take a step back because these lies are repeated so many times a day that they have a way of kind of sneaking into your mind and sitting there until someone helps you take a step back and you can realize BS when it is flooding you at every turn. Well, that's that's what you've been able to do. That's what we hope that we're doing on this program as well. So it's always a joy to have you on. Any final uh, words? I know you, uh, I, I appreciate your preparation and thought you put into these lies and picking out the, the, the I'm sure there are, there are legion and you've picked out some of the ones that are the most pre present today. Any final thoughts before we have to go? Yeah, one quick one. There's a lot of talk also about the economy recovered from COVID. It didn't. What recovered was the stock market. And there's no surprise because the Federal Reserve pumps money into the banks and insurance companies who have no reason to produce more goods because the American people can't buy them. So they push that money into the stock market. They bid up the price of shares. And those people, the 10% who own 85% of our shares, they're very happy. And since those are the same people that control the mainstream media, we hear about the recovery that they're busy celebrating. Mm -hmm. But for the mass of people, that's a lie. 
their economic situation is more precarious now than it was before this pandemic hit. Thank you so much, Professor Wolf, for that. I think that makes everyone feel better that it's not just them. It's not <laughs> just them. Oh, gosh. Professor Richard Wolf, find economic update on YouTube and radio stations across the country. And don't forget to support Professor Wolf's work at Democracy at Work. Thanks so much for being with us. I always appreciate it. Thank you, Juliana. And I appreciate that you produce a program like this. You're watching Act TV. I'm Juliana Forlano. We'll be right back. All right. Welcome to our new segment. This is a this is something I would like to bring to you. We need to look at some of our kick ass progressives who are running and who have stepped forward as they have been encouraged to do by. Well, I think it was Bernie Sanders who said, you know, run for something. And there's a whole bunch of groups helping people run for things. And now people are actually running for things. And down in Florida, there is a special election coming up in just a few days, January 11th, 2022. That would be in a few days. Uh, a kick-ass candidate, Sheila Scherfless McCormick from the Democratic Party, is running. It's a special election to the U.S. House to represent Florida's 20th congressional district. She is on the ballot then. So if you're just tuning in now, make sure to tell your friends in Florida that they should vote for this lady because you're going to want to do that once you hear more about her. Um, Shefless McCormick graduated from Howard University and St. Thomas University School of Law. She has uh, some course, coursework toward an MBA from the University of Maryland, and she was a project manager for the New York City Subway, the transit authority there, in 1999, so far ago in the 19s. She joined Trinity Healthcare Services, where she became the CEO. So she knows about people. She knows about health. She knows about transportation. She knows about a lot of stuff. And I just want to bring you um, a video that she, where she was speaking to Marianne Williamson. Marianne Williamson is having an endorsee candidate summit. You know, Marianne has a very large audience uh, of people of conscience who may or may not be politically informed, maybe not politicos, don't follow politics as much. And she has done a lot of outreach to make sure um, that her folks understand what's at stake. Uh, and as such, she has done something called an endorsee candidate summit. And this is uh, Sheila is one of her endorsees. So this is a video of Sheila speaking to Marianne about her run. It truly is an honor for me to be here this evening speaking to everyone. And um, I am a mom, wife, and I've been CEO for a healthcare company now for the last 10 years. And I actually got into it because I'm a little Haitian girl whose parents came from Haiti, first generation, and I just fought hard all my life. All I heard was no. Um, I put myself through law school and I was getting my MBA. My daughter was diagnosed with um, a learning disability while I was going through law school. And then I started fighting and her teacher started supporting me to get the resources, but I just kept on hitting a, a brick wall. At that time, I started seeing the other parents who were with us looking for resources, and I ended up up having to take a year off. At, for in that year, I started realizing that it wasn't just me. And I went to our elected officials. I went to other people to see if they would fight for my family, if they would fight for me as a single mother to help get my daughter the resources she needed, but they didn't. And it was at one point when I realized that it's like I was being cemented into poverty. My student loans were killing me. I was paying out of pocket for different therapies for my daughter. I was doing everything that I was supposed to do in society to make it. But yet there was a prison to school to prison pipeline that was built for me and my family. And something clicked inside of me that said, not me, not today, and not us, not my community. And that's when I got up and I fought. I started advocating in Congress to ensure that we had health care. Health care was trying to, it was going to include mental health and that our children was going to get the resources they needed. I fought night and day for 10 years going to Congress on my own dollar to make it. As I started moving and talking about the Affordable Health Care Act, we started experiencing a tremendous amount of success and our business grew. We started having a vocational school where we taught over a thousand people how to get their licenses as an LPN, a CNA within the communities. We immediately saw our economic turnaround. 
during the pandemic, we even were able to acquire a, a federal contract, which we were servicing the entire state of Florida. And at that time, we hired over a thousand people and no one got paid less than $20 an hour. Everything they said we couldn't do, we did it. Everything they said we couldn't acquire, we acquired it. And it was only because I had the will and the want to. And I realized that no one is going to fight for me and my family and the community unless they've been in my shoes. No one ever expected this little Haitian girl to grow up whose parents came to the United States fleeing a, fleeing a dictator. No one expected me to be here. And, you know, they messed up for letting me be here because now I'm fighting for us. My mother was a maid. She worked at the Waldorf Historia. I saw her every single night fighting. And I swore to myself I would work every single day and I would live in my community, raise my daughter here. There's no reason why she should be displaced. There's no reason why we don't have health care. There's no reason why we can't live in the United States and all have an equal chance of living. This is the problem and this is why I fight. So everybody asks me what makes me so different than everybody else who's in my race. This is a special election. And I tell them one thing, I'm unbought and unbossed and I, I'm tenacious. No one will stop me from fighting for my family. And you guys all know how it is. When someone comes for your daughter, your family or your mama, it's a wrap. <laughs> so that's what I'm here to do. I'm fighting for all of us. And so I ask everyone to support us in this fight because we're on a cusp. And we have to ask ourselves, as we're, as we're celebrating all these first, first women, a number of women, uh, minorities, where do we take it further? When do we prioritize equality, social equality, economic equality. As Marianne stated in the beginning, we're on the cusp. We see that there's money being distributed federally for recovery. Are the people being prioritized? We can't let this moment slip by us without us being prioritized. And that's what I'm there to do. I don't get a pay raise by going to Congress. It's not gonna give me a better job by going to Congress, but what it does do, it allows me to actually leave our mark, a progressive mark, where we actually take back the people seat away from the lobby. We need to have the people represented and not the corporations and the people who enjoy taking their money and watching our demise. Once again, my name is Sheila Scherfless McCormick. You can reach me at any moment for Sheila for Congress. We have a People's Prosperity Plan. We're proposing a $1,000 stimulus check where we can have an economic release for the entire country, which would be proportionately. We see that many people right now, many mayors are pushing their own UBI system, and that is based on their own funding. That is disproportionate. We we actually need a plan that's economic recovery for everyone. Let's think of everyone, every American, every family, no matter who you are, your dog is your family. Families are so diverse. It's time for our families to evolve and move forward. And we are here to do that today. And I thank you, Marianne. I thank you all the candidates who are here as we fight together to move this forward. And I look forward to seeing every one of you in Congress as we bring this fight to them and take back the people's house. I love her. What's not to love? Hello, this sounds good. Sheila for district20.com. If you don't live in Florida's district 20 uh, and your mom does definitely forward her this video and her friends and put it on your Facebook page and whatnot. And if you don't know anyone there, you can do yourself a favor by sending $5 or whatever you can afford to Sheila for district20.com. This is the last uh, week or two of her race. The election there is on January uh, 11th. And we will be covering it. Thank you so much for watching this segment. We're almost done with our show. And because you're coming in here on uh, the, the our first show of 2022, we we talked about a lot of people who had been dead. You can take you can take Sheila off because I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> Thank you. I don't want her to. I, I don't want it to bleed into what I'm about to talk about. I've been a cat lover since I was little. I think I may have shown you this photo before. This is little old me and my little kitty. And uh, I find that uh, animals and cats specifically bring me a lot of joy, especially in such a dark time. It's really cute to watch my little new little kitten uh, chase my pen. So I took a video of it for you and I hope you enjoy it. Here it is. There's my girl. <laughs> She's been named Sweetie Pie. And you could see the lighting equipment behind her <laughs> for this exact show. That's what's happening. So I hope you enjoyed that. She will be making regular appearances on the program. You're watching Act Now. I'm Juliana Forlano. I hope we have made your life better. Definitely put some stuff in the comments. I'd be sure to read it. And uh, we're going to end the show with uh, a little more Betty White for you. Thanks for watching.
I have to say what I feel. Miami has so much appeal. A great place to get a seafood meal. Miami. Miami, Miami, you got style. Blue sky, sunshine, white sand by the mile. When you live in this town, each day is sublime. The coldest of winters are warm and divine. Miami, Miami, you got style. Blue sky, sunshine, white sand by the mile. There's ball clubs and nightclubs all within reach. Dance the samba till morning, then lie on the beach. Each view is a postcard, each day a great time. The cream of the crop hits the top of the line.